Chapter 10 After the sun had risen, Gunhild and Yara sat down to rest, and they ate the bread Gunhild had brought. Where are we going? asked Yara. Reba, said Gunhild, to my aunt and uncle's house. They've always been kind to me. Gunhild looked at Yadith in the light. One side of her face was covered in bruises. Are you okay after last night? she asked. It hurts. I'll heal, said Yadith. Do you need to sleep? Yadith shook her head. I can keep going. How long until we get there? Maybe by nightfall. It depends on how fast we walk. The way to Reba was grueling. The adrenaline kept Gunhild going for a while, but soon the lack of sleep caught up to her, and by midday she was dragging. Her mind was a flurry of questions. Would Ivar and Bera take them in? Could they protect her? How long would it be until Ragnolf found her? Would her mother disown her? Would she ever go home again, or would she start a new life in Reba? Was Ragnolf riding after her right now? Early on in the journey, she imagined scenarios where Osbjorn, back from trading, challenged Ragnolf to a duel and killed him. No, wounded him, just enough to win. Then she would marry Osbjorn. Or she would spend her days with her uncle on the Wadden Sea and wake up each day to the smell of salt spray. Or she would get a loom and weave beautiful cloth patterns that she would sell at the market, and everyone would be amazed at her skill. Yadith was silent, and Gunhild couldn't tell what she was thinking. She realized that Yadith's position was more difficult than hers. Yadith belonged to her mother, and even if her mother let Gunhild go, there was no reason she should give up Yadith, who was worth a good deal of money. Maybe I could buy her, Gunhild thought. It occurred to Gunhild that what she was doing now might count as theft. Was she actually stealing a slave from her family? She decided she wasn't, because if Yadith belonged to her family, she belonged to Gunhild too. It would be like taking one of the horses to Ripa. It doesn't count as theft if it's family property. As the sun reached its peak and began to sink, Gunhild found herself too tired to think. Her questions continued to echo in her mind, but without resolution. She often thought that if only Yadith would stop for a rest, so would she, but Yadith never stopped. She continued, silently, stone-faced, and Gunhild, unwilling to break the silence, kept pace. They arrived at Ivar's house near sunset. Ivar and Bera were delighted and surprised at seeing Gunhild, and they brought her in to feed her. Yadith followed her in, and though no one talked directly to her, they gave her food too. She sat on the floor in a corner. When Gunhild's cousin Bragi came in the house, Yadith didn't react, though Gunhild was sure she noticed. All of her cousins were excited to see her, but Ivar and Bera seemed to sense that something must be wrong. As Gunhild ate, she told what had happened as best she could, though she felt herself weighed down with exhaustion. Ivar and Bera listened carefully. "'You poor thing,' said Bera when Gunhild had finished. "'But we have to tell your mother you're here.' "'You can stay with us, of course,' said Ivar, "'as long as you like. "'But Bera's right. "'We can't just let your mother worry.' Ivar gestured to Bragi. "'Bragi, you need to take the message to Thorvi. "'You should probably set off now. "'Dress warmly.' Gunhild looked over to the corner and saw that Yadith had already fallen asleep, her head leaning against the wall. She felt she was about to do the same. Guni, dear, take Bragi's bed, said Bera. He'll set off tonight. Bera took Gunhild by both shoulders. Gunhild realized that she was slightly taller than her aunt now, and wondered when that had happened. I'll get you a blanket, said Bera. Don't worry. Everything is going to be all right. Gunhild awoke the next morning to find the household already busy. Yadith was helping Bera peel vegetables. Dagnu and Signu were combing and braiding their hair. Gunhild wished she could stay in bed. She was still tired, but couldn't stand to be the only one not busy. She ate some food and found Ivar outside. I was thinking you could go out with Ofig today in the boat, said Ivar, who was busy mending nets. You know what you're doing, and it would let me stay home and work. Gunhild loved the idea of going out on the water, but it was hard to keep her spirits up. They readied the fairing, and she steered as Ofig rode. As they traveled downriver, he tried to amuse her with some stories. He even tried a song. Rowing on the winding river, sailing on the salty sea. Storms may shake my little ship, but I'll come home to marry thee. He looked at her hopefully, but her heart was too heavy to smile. 
They fished in the wadden sea around the sandbars and small islands where the seabirds circled and dived. Gunhild handled the boat skillfully and appreciated the chance to get her mind off her problems, if only for a few minutes at a time. They cast the net and hauled it in. Gunhild grabbed the fish, gave them a sharp whack, and passed them to Ofig to slice open, clean, and toss into the bottom of the boat. She wished she could stay here forever. Nothing good waited for her on land. I know you're in an awful spot, cousin, said Ofig. I wish there was some way we could help. If my father can talk to Ragnolf, maybe. Gunhild appreciated his concern, but it didn't seem useful. I wish I had something to give to Freya, she said. The gods take gifts cast into the water, right? I suppose, said Ofig. I'm no Guthi. I don't know what the gods want. But yes, people do throw gifts in the water. How do people even have anything the gods want? said Gunhild. Jarl Thorstein sacrifices a horse each year, but surely the gods have plenty of horses. Here, then, said Ofig. He stood and took out his razor-sharp knife. Listen, gods, he said loudly toward the horizon. Listen, Freya and Froy, Odin and Thor. Keep my cousin Gunhild safe. He ran the blade quickly along the palm of his hand, leaving just enough of a cut for some scarlet drops of blood to bead together and begin to drip. He held his hand over the side of the boat and let the drops fall into the water below. Gunhild felt herself choke up. Here was her grown-up cousin willing to bleed for her. But would it do any good? She added her own prayer to Freya, the goddess she always felt closest to, and wondered if drops of blood could protect her. The family had no way of knowing when Bragi would return, and whether anyone would come with him, so they continued about their days. Gunhild's stomach remained in knots most of the time, wondering who might come, and what that would mean. She hoped that if anyone came, it would be her mother and not Ragnolf. Nevertheless, two days later both her mother and Ragnolf rode up to the house, Bragi following behind them. Gunhild was outside spinning cloth with Dagnu when they arrived. Her mother jumped down from her horse and ran to hug Gunhild, but Gunhild found it hard to return the hug. Her eyes were locked on Ragnolf, who was staring at her, too. Ivar greeted all three warmly and asked them to come into the house, and Bera started making food. Ivar filled a cup with mead for Ragnolf and spoke to him cheerily about the upcoming harvest and the merits of beans versus peas. Ragnolf spoke as little as possible, it seemed. Thorvi helped Bera cook and barely said a word. Soon everyone gathered for a midday meal. Ivar complimented his wife's food, but the conversation quickly dwindled. They ate in silence for a moment, before Bragi said, I could tell a story. Gunhild knew from before that Bragi liked stories, but something in his amused half-smile told her that this was unusual. Once there was a dwarf named Hreithmar, Bragi began. He was a powerful sorcerer. He had three sons named Regan, Fofnir, and Otter. Otter could change his form into any animal, and he loved to go exploring. He especially loved being an otter and going fishing in the ocean. Gunhild saw Ivar give Bragi a sideways glance, as if something seemed wrong. Gunhild knew the story, and it sounded correct so far. Bragi continued, One day, Odin, Loki, and Hunnir were out hunting, and they saw an otter catch a big salmon, and Loki bragged that he could catch an otter and a salmon with one shot. He took a rock and threw it at the otter. It was a perfect shot, and he made good on his boast. The otter was struck dead. The gods took the otter and the salmon with them, and stopped at the next house they came to, which was Hreithmar's. Well, of course, the otter was really Otter, and when Hreithmar saw what they had done, he was furious. You killed my son, he shouted at the gods. You must pay for your crime. I demand his blood price. Ragnolf didn't seem interested in the story, and kept eating but Ivar seemed worried somehow. He kept trying to catch Bragi's eye, but Bragi smiled and continued as if nothing was wrong. Hraithmar skinned the otter and demanded that the gods return it filled with gold. They said they would do it, but Loki had a plan. As Bragi continued to tell how Loki filled the otter skin with cursed gold and a gold ring which would destroy anyone who owned it, Gunhild suddenly realized what was worrying Ivar. Whether Bragi knew it or not, there were parallels between his story and their family. 
Her father, Ragnolf, and Inga were three siblings, like the three brothers. Kettle went hunting over the sea like an otter and was killed. His death brought riches to his family, like the gold paid to Hreithmar. But what made the story dangerous is what came next. Otter's brother, Fofnir, always the most aggressive of the brothers, became so obsessed with the gold that he killed his father and stole it. He fled to a cave far in the mountains and lived there with the gold, caring for nothing else. Over time, he became a dragon, a vile creature that breathed poison and terrorized the people for miles around. Was Bragi saying that Ragnolf was like Fulfnir? Had greed turned Ragnolf into a monster? Gunhild couldn't know whether that was what Bragi was hinting at, but if Ragnolf thought that that was his meaning, there would be trouble. She looked at her uncle, who was still eating, and couldn't tell what he was thinking. Bragi had gotten to the part where Regan adopts a boy named Sigurth as a foster son, and one day tells him about the dragon Fulfnir. He continued the tale about Sigurth, his sword Gram, his horse Grani, and how he then killed Fulfnir by hiding in a hole and waiting for the dragon to walk over him. Ragnolf never seemed to pay much attention, and Ivar seemed relieved. Maybe Bragi never meant anything in particular by choosing this story. Maybe it was only in Gunhild's imagination that her uncle had been changed into a dragon by his greed. It was possible, though, that Bragi was trying to send her a message. He could have been saying he was on her side. After they had eaten, Ivar asked if he could speak to Thorvi alone, but Thorvi stood quickly and said that he should speak to Ragnolf instead. Head lowered, she left the house. Bera looked worried, but Ivar nodded to her, and she led the others out behind her. Gunhild didn't want to be with anyone except maybe Yadith, who had been sent to eat dinner outside. Gunhild walked around the back of the house to check by the woodpile that was stacked next to the wall, and, not seeing anyone, she crouched against the wall and waited. She hadn't intended it, but she could hear the voices from inside the house quite well. If she leaned her head against the wall near a gap in the siding, she could hear everything. Ivar was saying, Ragnolf, we're honored to have you here. Stay as long as you like. Then came Ragnolf's gruff voice. There's no need. The girl will come with us. That's up to her mother, said Ivar. Gunhild heard the bowls and cups clatter as Ragnolf pounded the table with his fist. It's up to me! <laughs> I'm her uncle. I'm just as much her uncle as you are, said Ivar calmly. Ragnolf's voice rose. You're a fisherman. Do you see this arm ring? It's gold. I've led men into battle. I'm one of the Jarl's men. You're a free man, said Ivar, and so am I. I take no orders from you. You'll take orders from my sword. How dare you threaten me, said Ivar. If you kill me, your life is forfeit. You'll be an outlaw despised by men and hunted. And who will prosecute me, said Ragnolf? Who exactly will hunt me down? Can your wife swing a sword? Are you friends with some warriors I've never met? Gunhild strained to hear as Ragnolf lowered his voice. You're a fisherman, old man. No one would miss you, no one would avenge you, and no one would prosecute me before the Jarl. For a moment Gunhild could hear only the sound of breathing. Then came Ivar's voice. He sounded like a man who knew he had lost. I knew you when you were a boy, he said. You used to split logs to buy your dinner. That boy died on the salt waves. A wolf came back in his place. I can see that, said Ivar, and Gunhild heard the door close behind him as he left the house. She stayed pressed up against the wall, hoping no one came around the side and saw her. Tears coursed down her cheeks. When she had composed herself, she walked to the river, hoping it would help her calm down and think, but luck was against her. Her mother was there already, and she heard Gunhild approach. She turned to Gunhild and smiled, and reached out her arms for a hug. It was an odd smile, though, a smile that was covering up tears of her own. Gunny, I was so worried. Her mother hugged her, and, unable to help herself, Gunhild began to cry again. Everything will work out all right, said Thorvi. You'll see because I don't have to marry Geralf? No, because you'll be happy when you do. Trust me. They heard Ragnolf call from where he was saddling the horses, and Gunhild realized that they would be returning immediately. 
There would be no more negotiation, no more time to think. Thorvi walked back toward the house to help Ragnolf, leaving Gunhild by the river. Gunhild didn't bother wiping her tears. She looked around, a final, silent goodbye before she returned to a home that wasn't really hers anymore. As she looked around, her eyes landed on Ivar's boat, and she felt her heart start to race. She looked quickly toward the house, saw that no one was watching, and ran toward the boat. She untied the rope that moored it and grabbed a pair of oars. She heard a shout and looked to see Ragnolf and Thorvi rushing toward her. Her hands flew as she set one oar in place and used the other to push off from the bank. Ragnolf was sprinting toward her, but one strong pull at the oars thrust her into the river. She dipped the oars again, adding more distance. She could see Ivar's family coming out of the house to see the commotion. Ragnolf had almost reached the bank, and Gunhild shuddered to see the rage that twisted his face as he yelled for her to return. One more stroke propelled her further downstream. Wait! came a cry from the bank. Running alongside her was Yada, barely keeping up with the boat. Her face was panicked, and her legs were a blur. Upstream, Ragnolf saw Yadith running and began to chase after her. Jump in, shouted Gunhild, and she pulled hard on one oar to anger toward the bank. Yadith grabbed her dress to hitch it up as she readied to jump. Springing off the edge of the bank, she leapt into the moving boat and landed hard. The boat rocked, but Gunhild pulled on the oars again and sent it back toward the middle of the river. Yadith, in a crouch, clung to the sides and watched as Ragnolf, realizing they were beyond his reach, stopped running. You'll regret this! he shouted, red-faced. I'll find you! Yadith positioned the other set of oars and joined Gunhild rowing, and soon the house and Ragnolf were out of sight. What now? asked Yadith. Keep rowing, said Gunhild, still pulling at a frantic pace. She was panting, and her shoulders were already feeling the strain. She took a deep breath to calm herself and tried to relax and use her whole body to row. It had worked, she thought. They were putting more distance between themselves and Ragnolf at every stroke, and if they kept up this pace, they would reach the mouth of the river soon, and the sea beyond. And then what, she wondered. They had no food, no shelter, and nowhere to turn for help. Eventually, Gunhild slackened the pace, and they worked at getting a good rhythm going. Yadith seemed to know how to row, but the oars were heavy and awkward for her smaller arms. She struggled to keep her strokes smooth and even. Soon they were past Ripa and approaching the sea. Gunhild had to decide which direction to go, either north or south along the coast, or west across the open ocean. She surveyed the boat. Ivar's fishing net was still in the boat, as was a water skin. She picked up the skin to check it. It was half full and might last a day or so. Even if they caught fish on the open ocean, there would be no way to cook them, and they would run out of water quickly. Going west wouldn't work. As they emerged into the wide, gray waters of the Wadden Sea, Gunhild felt the wind blowing from the north and decided she might as well let it take her where it was going. If Ragnolf did decide to chase after them, they would need to get as far as possible before nightfall, and running before the wind would help. She turned the boat to face south and pulled in her oars, then moved carefully past Yadith to the back of the boat, raised the sail, and took hold of the rudder. Yadith also pulled in her oars and gave Gunhild an exhausted smile. We did it, she said. Gunhild wished she could be as positive, but she was having trouble thinking of how this journey could end well. For the moment, said Gunhild, at least now we can let the sail do the work. I don't know where to go next, though. Away, said Yadith, still smiling. Far away. She turned her face forward and moved to the bow of the boat. The wind carried the boat swiftly past sandbars and shorebirds. The islands that kept the North Sea at bay were visible in the distance. Kith is swaith of Bleofast, said Yadith. Bleofast, said Gunhild. Beautiful, right? Yesa, said Yadith, beaming. It is swaith of Bleofast. The weather held. The sky was gray, but there was no rain. After a few hours of sailing, Gunhild was getting hungry, and she knew it would be dark fairly soon. Do you want to try to catch some fish? she asked. Yes, said Yadith, excited. What do we do? Gunhild readied the net, trying to remember everything she had seen her uncle and cousin do. 
she checked that the net was firmly attached to the boat and flung it over the side. After a few minutes, they pulled it in and found they had caught three fish. Gunhild thought they were flounder. I haven't done this part before, said Gunhild, and she took out her knife. She realized she needed two hands to get the fish from the net, so she put the knife down and grabbed the fish, which was thrashing fiercely. She had no club to hit it with, so she smacked it against the side of the boat twice and picked up her knife. The fish refused to give up easily, though, and as soon as she let go, it wriggled out of her grip and dropped into the water. Gunhild looked at Yadith, who was staring, fascinated. Sorry, said Gunhild. We have two more, said Yadith. Maybe we should hit them while they're still in the net. Well, that's never how Ivar did it. That's okay, said Yadith, grinning widely, and she took hold of a fish through the net and began to pummel it with her fist. Eek, said Gunhild. You're a real dringer. Dringer? asked Yadith. You're a fighter. You're tough. Yadith reached into the net and pulled out the flounder, which had been thoroughly subdued. She handed it to Gunhild. Now try it, she said. It wasn't nearly as easy as Ofig had made it look. The fish was slippery, and its skin was tougher than she had thought. The cut she made down the middle was difficult, and when she reached inside, it was hard to grab anything firmly enough to pull it out. Eventually, however, she had two cleaned fish in the bottom of the boat. Let's pull in and make dinner, she said. They lowered the sail and rowed up onto a sandy beach, then jumped out and pushed the boat up past the tussocks of beach grass that marked the high tide line. Both of them got their feet wet, and Gunhild realized that she had no way to dry her socks. Gunhild looked around for firewood, but there were no trees nearby. She walked to the nearest tree, but there were no dead branches or dry sticks on the ground. She got what she could, mostly some damp sticks, and returned to the boat. She realized she needed some tinder to start the fire, but by then it was harder to see in the waning light. She got some beach grass, built a pyramid of sticks, and tried to light it with the flint, but the beach grass didn't burn well. Finally, a tiny fire smoldered between them, next to the boat, but they soon found that they had no good way to put the fish on the fire. At home on the hearth the process was easy, but now nothing was working the way it should. Gunhild managed to skewer a fish on a forked stick and hold it over the fire, but she might as well have been holding it over a candle. Time passed, her arm got tired, and the fish was no closer to being cooked. Gunhild offered Yadith the first bite, but Yadith declined. Gunhild held it to her mouth and nibbled tentatively around the edges. I think it's still pretty raw, she said. Then the fire sputtered and died. In the end, the girls decided that no matter how hungry they were, they wouldn't eat anything half-cooked, and that they might as well sleep. Yadith lay down in the sand next to the boat, using it as a windbreak. Gunhild was about to wrap up in her cloak, but realized that Yadith had nothing to use as a blanket. She lay down next to Yadith and put her cloak over them both. It didn't cover them very well. Now that the sun had set completely, it was impenetrably dark. The stars and moon were covered by clouds that night, and with neither lamp nor fire nearby, Gunhild could barely see her hand stretched in front of her. There was some comfort in the sound of the waves lapping and the crickets chirping. She could hear where she was, if nothing else. As she lay in the dark, a troubling thought occurred to her. We're thieves, she said. This boat is my uncle Ivar's. His family depends on this boat. What are he and Ofig and Bragi going to do tomorrow? Yadith didn't answer. Gunhild began to fret. She was scared of Ragnolf and angry at her mother, but Ivar had only ever been kind to her. What must he think of her now? He had taught her to sail, and she had repaid him by stealing his boat. We can never go back, said Gunhild out loud. How could we go back? That's the last time I've seen my mother. And Rolf. Oh no, and Brunyar. He won't even remember me when he grows up. Instead of crying, Gunhild felt a cold, sinking feeling growing over her. Did her family hate her now? Would they be ashamed when they talked about her? Would Ivar's family starve? Yadith's voice came quietly out of the darkness. We were slaves, she said simply, as if that answered everything. I wasn't, Gunhild said. If you say so, said Yadith calmly. 
Gunhild felt herself bristle unexpectedly. She felt insulted. A slave was the lowest thing there was, a shameful creature. She was the proud daughter of a farmer, and was about to say so, but she wasn't sure what Yadith had meant. "'Do you mean it's okay for slaves to steal?' she asked. Yadith sighed as if it should be obvious. "'We were slaves, and now we're free. We needed the boat. To be free, we needed the boat.' Yadith rolled to her side, facing away from Gunhild, who continued to brood. She couldn't get over the feeling that she had done something unforgivable.